Thank you. And um, the session is now being recorded. I will turn it over to our session leads. Go ahead, Andrew. Hey, so thank you so much, Aaron. And so obviously I would like to open by thanking the Carpentry Con organizers for accepting our proposal and also um, thanking the people to whom we reached out. Uh, this is a very important topic, I think, for the HBC Carpentry uh, community. The purpose of this meeting is to identify likely pain points or high friction or high effort pathways to that stand in the way of the sort of basic strategic goal of the HPC carpentry community to join the carpentries as a um, um, as a unit of the carpentries and operate under the carpentries umbrella. So um, I'm going to try and start with uh, introducing HPC carpentry. Uh, I think probably a lot of the people on the call don't uh, know who we are, and I'm going to try and do this as we did in the opening of the um, sprint session that we had on Monday by uh, sharing uh, the video of the lightning talk that will be also presented later during the lightning talk sessions. And I don't know if this is going to work, but I'm going to give it a shot. So I'm on the Linux Zoom client, which doesn't always do all of the things that I wish it did. Um, yeah, okay, and I'm not seeing... Okay, I can share my entire desktop. Uh, and go full screen on the video and okay. And I forgot to do the sound, so I will try it again. <laughs> Share sound. There it is. Greetings, Carpentry Con. My name is Trevor Keller, and I'm presenting this introduction to High Performance Computing Carpentry, a community effort in the carpentry's tradition, but not yet under the official umbrella. So what is high performance computing? Whether your computer has one account or many, when your hands are on the keyboard and mouse, you are in control of the machine. It's easy to install new software, upgrade or remove existing programs, and even swap hardware in or out to suit your needs. When you launch a program, it starts immediately. The output is displayed on screen, often with an option to save your work. If a program is slow, you can halt computing programs to try making it faster. While your computer may have high performance components, high performance computing usually refers to clusters of computers. Clusters are inherently shared resources. Each computer runs many programs at once on behalf of several different users, and large programs are distributed across several computers to break up the load. From your computer, you access a cluster over the internet through a gateway computer. Rather than launching your program directly, you must request an allocation of processors, memory, and time. A scheduler will determine whether one or several computers can satisfy your request, and the soonest time slot when the resources are expected to become available. If nobody else is using those computers, your program will launch immediately. Otherwise, it enters a queue and will launch as soon as the computers have finished running other users' jobs. So let's talk about HPC Carpentry. Over the decades, the cost of building a high-performance computing cluster has fallen. They are, after all, built from regular computer hardware. Most academic and research institutions have at least one cluster with access readily granted to research groups and students. Training materials, documentation, and expert knowledge have also grown, but access to this knowledge has not scaled nearly as well as the hardware. The HPC Carpentry community grew as administrators and practitioners sought to guide users through this gap and develop a training program that could be reused by others. The Carpentry's approach to hands-on instruction builds muscle memory and leaves learners with high quality code after the workshop is finished. Lessons from established Carpentry's curricula in related domains provide an excellent foundation for us to build on. The HPC Carpentry community was created by Peter Steinbach in 2016 with a lot of early contributions from people at Compute Canada. We have met online twice a month since summer of 2019 to coordinate lesson development efforts and grow the community with strong representation from around the globe. Our vision is to be the leading inclusive community teaching data and coding skills for HPC resources. 
our mission is to lower the barrier to entry to high performance computing operations for a wide range of users so that more people can benefit from the increasing availability of increasingly sophisticated computer systems. Our strategy to achieve this goal is to develop and aggregate educational resources and work closely with like-minded communities. Our steering committee seats six members elected in the spring of each year following an asynchronous GitHub-based democratic process. The geographic diversity of the committee reflects the global nature of our efforts. Most interactions with the cluster are made through the command line, so the lesson on Unix shell from Software Carpentries is a prerequisite for all our lessons. In fact, we recommend teaching it as a first lesson in an HPC Carpentry workshop for novice users. With a strong foundation on the command line, learners can then connect to their cluster, find out how many computers there are and whether any are available, write and submit their first job scripts, then retrieve output data when their program finishes. Following these fundamental interactions, these HPC users can learn how to manage dependencies between data generation and analysis on the cluster, write an automated workflow script, and use it to learn how much performance a program gains for each additional processor they throw at it. Instructors can offer follow-up lessons or workshops to cover topics in parallel programming and performance optimization. We currently have lessons using the Python and Chapel programming languages, as well as the popular molecular dynamics software, LAMPS. As we develop more advanced lessons, it will become easier to stack these modules together to customize a workshop to meet your learners exactly where their skills and interests intersect. Thank you for your interest in HPC Carpentry. Please join our community on GitHub or the Carpentry Slack channel, or both. We are actively developing the lesson on workflows and would love to have your help. That's all for now. Enjoy the rest of CarpentryCon. Okay, so that is the intro. Um, now I just need a minute or two to manage some windows. All right, so there's another, so I'm gonna now share um, some, uh, the last of a couple of introductory slides that will help, I think, focus on um, the purpose of this meeting in particular. Hopefully that was a good introduction. This one does not have sound. All right, so you should now be seeing the HPC Carpentry brief, brief introduction slide with the big logo on it. And uh, so this um, next slide I think was covered in the video. Um, we have a couple of tracks that we're in the process of developing. So um, just, to, just to frame this, uh, we have, uh, some of the sort of basic elements, we have some content, we have a community, we think we have an audience. Um, these are the kind of prerequisites that are probably, you know, the most basic prerequisites that are necessary for becoming, uh, joining the Carpentries. Um, and we have a plan of action um, for um, developing these work, de developing lessons into coherent workshops that uh, could be administered by somebody who isn't us. Um, the current roadmap includes, uh, as it says here, uh, complete development of the HPC user workshop. So there's two workshops. I think this probably was on the previous slide. Yeah, so there's two tracks that we're thinking of at the moment, an HPC users workshop, which starts with Shell, and an HPC intro, which is our most developed lesson. Uh, and then following up with some example applications using data analysis or containers or something that, that the point is these would be black box applications that users would just run. And uh, the point of the lesson is to convey the advantages of running in parallel on HPC resources so the perf performance increases and also the challenges with data management and, and workflow construction. And then there would also be an HPC developers workshop track, which would also start with Unix shell and HPC intro lesson, but would be more of a focus on programming. Like how do you develop, how do you write a program that benefits from uh, HPC resources? And then there's a bunch of other material uh, that we kind of have our eyes on that, that don't uh, lend themselves naturally in our opinion to a workshop, but we don't want to lose track of this stuff. So we're kind of aggregating and documenting that, trying to make it easier to find for people who maybe do have workshop ideas or, or who just want to teach it. Um, so uh, the current roadmap is uh, complete the development of these uh, um, of the user workshop. That's the current focus. The sprint on Monday was about the 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 work the follow up lesson for the user workshop using the Snake Make workflow tool. Um, we need to identify an example application uh, 
to build a coding lesson, a uh, coding track around uh, capture the diverse additional materials, including we have some resources that we have our eye on on GPU programming. The video mentioned the chapel uh, language lesson and uh, some uh, there's a singularity container lesson that is not well adapted to HPC that we think we can possibly build on. Um, and outreach, of course, is a big part of uh, what we want to do to build the community. Um, so um, using um, so we're we're in the Carpentries incubator. We talk to Carpentries people fairly often. Uh, we're we've uh, did a boff at Supercomputer 21. We got some pretty good engagement. Um, we're doing a bunch of stuff here at CarpentryCon, um, and there are also a number of other sort of ACM, uh, the Association for Computing Machinery, uh, is a is an organization that that they're the people who run supercomputing, the SE conference, uh, and they have a number of other conferences which uh, which have educational tracks. Uh, so the peer and SE23 and others are some of those that we're aware of. And so we're thinking we will, we will, those, those are good places for outreach. Um, so these are the materials that are um, currently available. Um, so I think the repo for the main site is uh, actually, I'm not sure if the repo is in the um, Cody or in the chat. Um, but a lot of all of this stuff is linked from the main site and these uh, these slides are in the meeting resources for this uh, session, uh, so you can get to all these links that way. Um, so that brings me to this meeting, which is kind of about the sort of. The, the phrase that leaps to mind that I almost don't want to say is the unknown unknowns right, so this is the thing about um, like when we if we join the carpentries when we join the carpentries let's be optimists um there will be a number of things that we need to do differently um we need we will need in order to operate at full sort of full carpentry scale we will need people to be able to stand up workshops who are not us um so um the most thing the most the, the thing that scares me the most is the that all of these workshops necessarily require a clusters right so this is not like the python or, or the Git workshops where you where you can show up with your laptop and download the the Windows Git tool or have a shell, and and be on your way. You you need to uh, stand up a cluster, and that implies you need to do accounts. And there's various sort of logistical requirements that the, that a cluster uh, must meet in order to operate. Um, how easy does that need to be? How what? Uh, capabilities can the carpentries organization bring to bear on that problem and what uh, capabilities do we need to uh, bring to bear. Uh, one thing I will say is that we have, uh, I think making it turnkey is probably possible. We have some pretty good tools and in all modesty, the HPC carpentries communities technical excellence seems to me to be extremely high. Um, so there's a lot we can do, but there's a question of what should we do uh, and where, where, how can we meet the carpentries community as near as possible where they already live? Um, there's also a money issue. So for cloud resources, if we're going to stand up uh, transient clusters on the cloud, which is a, a good answer, um, who pays? Um, is there, will the carpentries organization have some kind of contract or some kind of access to funding? Is this something that we, the carpentry, HPC carpentry community, need to make available? Uh, can we charge a fee? Um, who are donors we should maybe reach out to. And then there's for transient clusters There's another question that arises from them about um, how long should this cluster live, right? So the, the video mentioned that, that learners will come away with high quality code, that's true. It, uh, but if the transient cluster on which they did the, ran the code disappears after, you know, immediately after the lesson, um, it may compromise the ability of them to leverage that code in other contexts. Um, so those are kinds of the questions that are on my mind. Um, so with that introduction, I would like to, I'll stop sharing and, and open the floor to other comments, blind spots, things I missed, things that scare other people. Toby. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I think the, the question that was missing, but that seems extremely relevant to all the other questions about um, how we pay for the cluster resources required for a workshop 
is the question of how much you think those cluster resources are likely to cost. Um, because my understanding of cloud costs is that you can pay not very much if you don't need very much, but you can also very easily and somewhat accidentally end up racking up very large costs. And so what do you think is the ballpark figure for a, a two day workshop for 25 learners? So, Yeah, okay, that's a good question. I mean, my my ballpark guess off the top of my head is that that's probably um, tens to maybe a hundred dollars, um, but I don't I don't have a solid number on that. That's just an order of magnitude. Albert. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm wondering. Uh, uh, about the last part, the need to have a cluster uh, if i'm not sure that people who don't have access already uh, would be interested that much uh, in such a course so i think in most cases uh, or, or at least in a lot of cases uh, some organization which already has a cluster would ask uh, would have users that are not really adept in HPC and then the cost part wouldn't be that big uh, big of a problem. Yeah, so our, our early experience is that there are people who don't have clusters who do want to do this. Um, I mean, so your what your your framing was actually my initial model, my part of my motivation, my, my sort of ulterior motive for getting started with this was that I run a cluster and I wanted smarter users. And so, uh, or more yeah. experienced users, smarter is not fair. Because um, um, yeah. I, I worked in two places, two places right. uh, where there were clusters and users who were, you have a big computer here, you can do what you want. So right. they didn't really know how to use it. Yeah, but, um, but we have seen particularly uh, some members of our steering committee um, have done lessons where they have uh, needed to stand up clusters, uh, sometimes because um, the people operating the workshop are not the site operators, right? So there may be, there may be a site where that has users that want to uh, upskill their users, but they don't wanna make space on their cluster or not all of the users are members of the institution. So, so you need the flexibility of being able to stand up a cloud cluster. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, it has come up, uh, so. So that's 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 a good question, but the answer is uh, we actually do have this requirement. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. I think Benson had the next hand. Um, so just saying, yeah. Uh, there's also a lot of HPC you can do in the cloud, um, and at least for many institutions, that um, that will prove to be quite popular. Also for research groups. Um, some universities actually also have clusters, but they charge, uh, and they may not have a software stack that um, that particular research group is using. In which case, um, something on the cloud might be more flexible. Thank you, Benson. Flex. Thank you. Um, first of all, it's I've been following HPC Carbon for a while. Also, earlier when I was still on the executive council. Um, was on a call and advised a bit about the road to becoming a lesson program. But my main question after uh, seeing the video and, and the brief presentation, and I may have missed it, it seems to be that there's a, a two different kind of audiences. The first audience is that people that are, are running jobs, but they need bigger computers and they have heard about this cluster thing and they need to get started. So they're really like uh, almost zero entry would kind of expect them to know at least how to use their tool on a computer, maybe through Python or R or Studio or, or Unix, but at least that's the goal for, for them is, how do I get these things over on the cluster? How do I use that cluster? But I don't think you need more than a day maybe for that. You have an introduction to Unix shell and then you have an introduction to how to SSH into a cluster and start jobs day, day and a half. Um, and then there's the more, 
And this is much more diverse, as is my impression, that the people that actually have used the cluster for a while and they need to either scale up their programming or adjust their workflows or they need to be, I don't know what they want to do, use containers. I would be careful to keep the workshop for the first group very, very simple. Not, not add snake make or containers or anything else. Just let them get started and let them work on the cluster for a little while and let them, let them come back and do more advanced stuff. I, can, I think you can easily overload them with a two-day workshop where you try to fill the, the last part with something useful. But I'm sure you have thought about this and have experienced teaching these workshops. So I'm very curious to see what, what your thoughts about this. Yeah, we, we have thought about it. Um, the user track currently has a black box executable um, that just demonstrates uh, Amdahl's law for people who know what that is. Amdahl's law is a, is a rule about uh, how much benefit you can get from parallelization. And we have a sort of stunt executable that uh, has a certain amount of parallel work that it needs to do and a certain amount of serial work. And as you parallelize it, you start to see the, that the benefit trails off. Um, I think, um, yeah, so I mean, at the moment, the user workshop works more or less like you said, you could stop after HPC intro and then people who are knowledgeable about how to run an executable would probably get a benefit from that. Um, but I think um, my, my sense of it is that on in the HPC world, workflow and workflow management tools are becoming more common. And so I think introducing those is probably important. Um, but I, I don't think we have a solid answer. I think that's an open question also. So thank you for that. That's... Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Lex. Olayton has the next hand. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, this is more of um, a follow-up to what a couple of people have mentioned. Uh, from my experience, we do not need a cluster for the entire course. So what I have drafted because I've done um, a kind of my own customized um, lesson um, draft, just like combining the shell novice and a couple of other carpentries uh, material to do uh, the bash shell course. So what I have is just one module that says um, HPC, working on a remote HPC system working on a remote HPC system. Yeah, that's the module. And that's pretty much the part where they do things like SSH and stuff like that, which is the part that requires the actual uh, do stuff on you know, a cluster and things like that. And that would reduce the costs in terms of finding funding for access to a cluster if it's just you know maybe an hour or so of access that is required. And uh, one other benefit of that is that also from my experience, while trying to do workshops as hands-on and the students are following you, sometimes they make a mistake. You know, recently, I think maybe, yeah, this was on Monday actually. So I was teaching one of the researchers and he mistakenly while he was doing RM for, on his desktop star.txt, he later told me that he actually deleted some file with a name December something 2019.txt that he doesn't even know what the content is, but apparently he was working on his laptop. So one of the benefits of also not really having the students have that many hours or that much time on the cluster is just, you know, in case they're working with actual um, useful data, it minimizes that kind of accident. So, um, but then for the funding, I think the NSF might have some uh, funding for for stuff. I don't know if somebody wanted to say something, but I think that's just all I want to say. I don't want to spend too much time. Okay. So I, I wasn't super clear on your, so um, it sounded like you you opened with saying maybe we don't need a cluster, but then you were, you described a scenario where somebody does SSH into a remote system. Okay, I, on his laptop, he was working and he deleted star.txt as part of the things we were trying out while working through the bash of course. So the, Oh, I see. What I do is I start with the laptop, regardless of the, uh, how, the nature of the students or what they do, I usually just start with laptop work for most of the modules. And I try to minimize the access to cluster to just the module that says, working on a remote HPC system. I have a module on my course 
which is just that, and that's where they do SSH. And that's why I was saying that that model minimizes the cluster access time to just that module, basically, for the most part. Most of the other things like shell scripting and the likes, they just do it on their computers, their laptops. Yeah, okay. That, that's, a, that's an interesting approach. We, we don't do that. We do, I mean, we, we sort of separate out, like, so our, the current user track scheme is the first lesson is, is in fact, straight up uh, HPC or Unix shell intro from the Carpentries. We, we don't develop, in, in fact, we made a decision, I guess, about a year ago. There used to be an HPC shell lesson and what we found was that we were duplicating a lot of the content from uh, Unix intro and the Unix intro one is much better maintained. They have a larger pool of maintainers. It's a way better lesson. So we ditched ours and we put a module at the beginning of HPC intro that basically fills in the gaps for like you know, being able to SSH and stuff. Um, so we're, we're sort of half doing what you said, right? So the first lesson is, is the, the stock, so to speak, Unix shell intro, but the second lesson is very engaged on the cluster, right? You spend half a day, the full lesson, I mean, the, the module one is SSH to the cluster, right? And then module two is SInfo and all the other uh, cluster operation commands. So, uh, yeah, so it's, in, it, it's, we hadn't, I think we had not thought of the strategy of minimizing time on the cluster. I think we were closer to maximizing it, um, but that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Um, also, I mean, so, Data protection is uh, also a thing. Um, so on the cluster that I operate, we have some protection against accidental deletion. So if somebody makes a mistake on the cluster, um, possibly it could be recovered from, but they would need to work with the admins. Um, certainly having as safe an environment as possible is a good idea. But on the other hand, that, that's sort of some tension between making the environment safe and also making the environment you know, the same as what you would have in a, in a sort of real, right, um, or unprotected uh, production HPC environment. Uh, I'm not sure how to balance that tension, but, uh, but it is, it definitely exists. Thanks. Um, I also had, I guess, the, the, we, we've thought about NSF funding too. There's, there is this, I guess, now uh, the Exceed program in the United States is going away, but it's being replaced by something else. Um, those are US specific resources. Uh, they're certainly useful for people in the United States who are doing workshops and we will look into those, but we're, I think we would like a more general solution that's, that's wider, has casts a wider net. Thank you so much. Great questions. Um, Rohit has a hand and then we'll take some hands from the chat. Yeah, so I was just wondering about like a couple of things about this. Like, so one of the one of the lessons planned is like lamps on an HPC system, which brings us to a whole different realm of problems and, and potential solutions, right? Which is like, how do you compile software or how do you, you know, make the best use of the research software, which you actually intend to use on the cluster itself? And of course, you know, this is not necessarily easy because it requires more of an in-depth understanding of which queues you have, you know, what resources are behind the queues and what you actually can submit to which one. And that becomes increasingly complicated if you don't. Um, so if, if we just want to do slurm submission scripts or slurm basic commands, right, it's great if you're submitting to like the general CPU queues, or if someone tells you, hey, this workflow needs to be run on this magic GPU queue. But beyond that, then people need to understand like a lot more. And the question is, at what stage do we need to explain that? And how much can they rely on like the sysadmins? So some, I know some lessons in this sphere, like in HPC spheres, are like the ENCCS ones, let me leave a link in the chat. They're geared purely towards separate applications. So they're like, if you use Julia, then how do you use that on this compute architecture? And that's... Perhaps it's an advanced topic, but also it's more of an application-oriented thing. So it might be more easy for people to connect to. Yeah. So I we sort of we have thought a little bit about that. Um, so the, the 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 HPC developer track is the least mature of the two tracks that we're we're contemplating. Um, but I think the idea there is it would include building something. Uh, probably something simple to begin with. Um, we do do a little bit of like how to use the resource effectively in the HPC intro lesson. At the end, there's a there's a bit about um, 
one of the things is a lot of uh, cluster systems uh, have time limits and um, making a good estimate of how much time your job is going to take is an important part of being a, being a responsible citizen on a shared environment. Uh, if you just ask for the, for the moon, uh, then the time it will take for your job to dispatch will be longer and the queuing system will not be able to efficiently schedule jobs around it. And so that's a, that's a citizenship uh, 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 feature or, or uh, issue. And it cuts both ways, right? So being a poor, I mean, I think on a lot of queuing systems, being a poor citizen will put you at a disadvantage, making your job harder to schedule. So we kind of have touched on some of those issues and we could, I think at this point, we could probably claim that we set the stage for some of the things you discussed, but we don't really engage with them at this point. Thank you so much, Andrew and Rohit. We had a question in the chat from John Shadaki. I'll read it out. One thing that I like about the Carpentries model is that learners can and will become instructors. They get excited by the pedagogy and the content and are confident enough to become an instructor. Do you think that this is likely in HPC Carpentry? Do you think there will be this type of overlap between the instructor and learner communities? Um, that is a good question. I don't think I, I know the answer. Uh, like I said, I got into it because of a certain level of frustration with users uh, not being as aware as I wanted them to be or as knowledgeable as I wanted them to be about cluster ops. Um, it looks think, like Cher, Cher may have an answer for us. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so um, on our end from the, the core team or the administration side, um, we do expect and hope that, you know, as we train instructors, regardless of, you know, their background, that it's if they're coming in as an instructor, you know, as an HBC um, participant or uh, with that background, it is our hope that once they become trained, they then will become HPC instructors. Um, and it's really, um, it's really organic in that sense. And so it starts off our, the way we like to think of it is, you know, participants, learners, they go through a carpentry's workshop, whether it be software carpentry, library carpentry, HPC. Once they become that learner, they then elevate to become, oh, this is kind of cool. Let me try to be a helper. And now from that helper, it's, oh, okay, I think I really could do this. Let me go ahead and be an instructor. And then from there, they get put into that centrally organized workshop pool where they will become an instructor for centrally organized workshops um, as well as self-organized workshops. And I wanted to touch um, on the question about the fees momentarily. And so for centrally organized workshops, we, the carpentries, we would um, cover that cost. And when we say cover that cost, we will ensure that the cost of whatever it takes to um, put on that workshop is included in the centrally organized workshop fee. So therefore, however many cloud instances or, um, that are needed for HBC workshop, we will make sure that that's taken care of. However, on the self-organized uh, workshop side, that is where we would want to make sure that the HBC community has a solid foundation or recommendations for the community. If someone is looking to put on a self-organized workshop, these are the things that you want to consider. Um, right now, for centrally for self-organized workshops, the carpentries we do um, very. Um, there's a limited amount of things that we do to support them. And generally it's putting their information, putting their workshop on the website and making sure that they get their um, survey links. But aside from that, it is up to the um, instructors and the workshop hosts putting on that self-organized workshop to have all of the resources in place for what they need for that workshop. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Cher. And I'll just say with all the hands and all the people excited to share and, and ask and answer questions, this is one of the most interesting um, interactive sessions I've seen so far at CarpentryCon this year. So thank you all. Um, Trevor has the next hand. We're winning already. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about um, winning. Sorry. Um, <laughs> it's about me winning. No, wait. So, us, us, Andrew. Oh, uh, yeah. This is how our meetings usually go. Anyway, so on the, so for, um, on the topic of um, learners, the learner to helper to instructor pipeline, I think that so 
certainly personally, that's also my goal and how I'm looking at um, as we develop our curriculum and lesson program and refine our lesson materials. I'm trying to make sure that we, even if we're not there yet, that we have uh, some um, pathway to make teaching the materials as um, background independent as possible. Something that, um, so every HPC cluster is configured differently. So what we've done in the lesson materials is to use Jekyll's templating facilities um, to insert custom content in various places automatically in the lessons when they're built. Um, and the way that we do that is we have some variables in the top level config.yaml and then a snippet library that um, content gets pulled in from when you build the site using particular flags, which means that deploying a website for a particular cluster, uh, so you can't just link to the, okay, in your lesson workshop, normally you set the agenda and for each lesson you link generally to like the Software Carpentries Unix shell lesson. For us, people can and do link to the HPC Carpentry HPC intro lesson, but you can, and if you have a specific cluster in mind, should build your own site and deploy that with your site customizations in place, which is what we've been doing as cluster experts is building the snippet libraries, deploying our own versions of the lesson with that snippet library called out and in place so that reading through it, you get your the name of your machine that you're going to log into in the lesson instead of some generic value and then um, cluster specific output um, to make it feel as familiar as possible. Going forward, if we're preparing, helping people with centrally organized workshops, there will probably be have to be some handholding and support from us, the core HBC Carpentry team, to help people develop snippet libraries or make sure that a customized um, lesson site is in place for their cluster or cluster type so that they can teach to that and not have to configure it themselves. It'll just be there for them. Thank you so much, Trevor. Uh, Carrie has the next hand. Hi, this has been so great to learn more about HPC Carpentry. So thank you for the presentation. One of the, uh, my question is going back to the instructor pool and build, building an instructor pool to teach the workshops. One thing that has come up a lot in the Carpentry Con sessions that I've attended is um, some of the community members or instructors um, reluctant to teach lessons outside of what they're used to teaching. So I've heard a lot that, you know, I want to teach a software carpentry R workshop, but I've never done it before. I, I tend to stick to, you know, data carpentry or library carpentry. So I was wondering what, if if anyone on the call, not, not just Andrew, um, if you all have suggestions or ideas for encouraging instructors to teach other lessons than they're used to teaching. And Danielle says she hears that a lot. Danielle's our workshop administrator. <laughs> because we will see this problem once HBC is a lesson program. So right. Yeah, I don't I don't know that I have any. I mean, we, we think about this during the lesson development and editing process, but I don't know that we have like, this is another thing where I don't know that we have any solid answers other than just, you know, following our gut to try and make sure that the content is accessible to instructors as well as learners. Or does anybody else from the team have thoughts? My thought was around what, what Carrie just put in the chat around instructor onboarding. So mm. for some of the new curricula that we've launched, um, in particular astronomy, the data carpentry astronomy curriculum, which was just launched earlier this year, um, we've started an instructor onboarding process to make it um, an easier process for people who are already instructors but have not taught this new lesson before to kind of learn the ins and outs of the lesson and feel more prepared to go in and teach it. Um, so we've done some 
um, a YouTube video um, that people can watch that kind of explains the lesson and how it, how it works and that people can watch before they sign up to teach. Um, so that's, um, that's my response, but also it looks like maybe John has a response specific to this question. Toby, is yours a different question or did you? Yeah, but I'm not about to have to leave, so let John go okay. first. Okay, I'll, I'll call on John. Okay, um, I'm sorry, I, my internet is really bad apparently today, so if I, you can't hear me, please. Yeah, I just thought, I mean, it would be one of the, so um, I know some of the people involved in HPC Carpentry wrote in and asked for um, just people from the library carpentry's process to come and give some feedback, and I guess I, I was thinking about it. Um, this is a, obviously a very similar process, right? Um, there was a very passionate group of people who created library carpentry out in the world, um, had a lot of energy around it, and then started thinking about, well, how can we start to interact more with the carpentries? At the time, the carpentries hadn't merged, but it was still kind of like, how do we create this kind of formalizing of what we were doing? And I think uh, a few observations I think you've already hit on it uh, are that the Carpentries itself is not a big organization. It's not a, like we we kind of think of it as like, oh, wow, if we can just get this lesson organization set up, then like it'll be part of the mothership and it'll be self-sustaining and it'll be this big sh infrastructure. And I'd say one big thing that to always keep in mind is, you know, adding this as a lesson organization is not going to necessarily give structurally like tons of more resources. I'm not saying that to criticize anybody at all, but more that um, one of the big learning things that we went through was really trying to figure out how to basically uh, add resources to the carpentries um, as at the same time of bringing the library, the, this, the library carpentry community in as a lesson organization. So we did a lot of fundraising. Um, I personally got involved in library carpentry really because people from the library community across the University of California came to me and said, you're kind of good at fundraising. Can you help us? Because we wanted to fundraise. Um, I'm not saying that I have uh, some, you know, great examples of what funders to go to, but, um, or that it even has to be dollars, uh, you know, money. It could be um, people, but it really is one of these things where um, the carpentries excel itself will need to actually use more resources for the short term to get you in as a lesson organization and has to retool and re rethink the way that they present all of their operations. And this is not to detract you from doing it, but just to showcase that this does this is a labor intensive uh, process for a very strapped organization. And so it's really thinking of it as not just how to get the, the lesson organization into the carpentries, but how to make sure that they can maintain and thrive during that process, setting them up for success, setting, setting it, you guys up for success. Um, one model that we started with when we did this was that uh, the University of California went out and received a grant uh, to pay for one person to come in as a coordinator for the library carpentry transition. That person came in and was, was like, okay, well, this is gonna be great. We're gonna have one person who's gonna help coordinate everything. Um, I would say that that was not a good uh, process. It did not set the library carpentry community up for success or the carpentries because it was one person. Um, the carpentries is obviously a huge fabric of people. It's volunteers and professionals working on this topic. And when a new lesson organization comes in, it's it's really a change for everybody. And when it gets centralized around one person, it actually can cause a lot of issues. So I would just say, as you're looking for fundraising or you're looking for models, I would I would avoid the the temptation of saying like if we can just get one FTE, we would it would all be better if if at all, if at all that's what you've been thinking. Um, after about a year of doing that, we ended up changing the model and really taking the approach of what funding we were able to get uh, to kind of uh, fund a percentage of time across multiple functions across the carpentries, so additional capacity for the instructor training groups to, to think about how it would affect them and the curriculum development groups to see how it would affect them and the finance team to think how that and the, you know, the documentation teams, like everybody just having a more, more dedicated time to think about the onboarding of a new lesson organization. 
And so just kind of that, I'm not saying that I know if that is the right model, but just that's the one that we ended up it, that seemed to fit more and one that was fit for more of a sustainable future. Um, two things that I would bring up that I think are just lessons learned in maybe the less positive ways. I think the library carpentry uh, transition has been wildly successful in many ways. Um, just things to be careful about are the library carpentry community was extremely vibrant and like, I don't know, intimidating at some level for, <laughs> for, for several years. Um, when the carpentries process started, that energy um, it didn't have anywhere to go at some level. Um, and so it it resulted in kind of, you know, we the the group just definitely kind of had to mature and and move on into a new model. But there wasn't like um, we didn't state up front, like, where are all the people who currently are really, you know, identifying with library carpentry? Where are they all going to go? And what are they going to, how are they going to feel? And what are they going to do once uh, this lesson organization happens? And, and the carpentries are taking ownership over some things that they really, they really own. And I'm not saying I know that about your communities so much, but just like, it's something to really think about is like you people here and that are really involved, like, being realistic about what you want out of the transition and what you want and and knowing that you may need to be donating more of your time once it is a lesson organization not less of your time um it's it's not that you can just hand this off and it'll thrive and that gets to what i was referring to a little bit i i don't know the answer to it but one of the goals would be that the hbc carpentry becomes a lesson organization and um, it becomes somewhat self-sustaining from a community perspective, like the, the, the members of it, right? And so the ways that that happens organically in the carpentries community, one way is for learners to become instructors, to become trainers, and like it just kind of feeds itself. Um, if that is something that you think you, you know will happen, then that is great. But that is something that um, if it's not set up for that to happen, there has to be another way for this community to quote unquote self-sustain and stay fresh. Um, if you don't have that, um, it will become stale and it will become 10 years from now, it, this, this will not be considered the success that we would all want it to be. So it's really something we have to think about up front is not about the the structure of this within the carpentries or a lesson organization, it's actually about community. It's about like, who are we? Are we, you know, IT professionals teaching IT professionals? Or are we IT professionals teaching researchers? Do we think researchers would help with, with, um, with the process? I mean, I, I think there's just a, it's not that it's insurmountable at all. I don't, I don't want to make it sound that way, but it's really, it needs to be somewhat deliberate. Um, and just very candid with yourselves about what what who you are and what you're trying to do. Um, because I guess my big thing here is like the, the Carpentries small organization doing mighty and really big work, but it's really about that there's people out there in the wild that are like growing the the sessions and the the learning and the modules and putting in all the time. And we gotta think about like 10 years from now, how is HPC Carpentry going to flourish in that way? Um, so I guess I don't have anything else, but I was, that's, that's outstanding. That's helpful. Th that is, that's outstanding. Thank you so much for that. That is, that's exactly the kind of thing that I was looking for when I, when I asked the library people or any uh, people who have experience with onboarding or with joining up, I think the, yeah. the, so I, we've had some conversations with, uh, in our, in our organizational or coordination meetings about, um, in particular, the, you know, it's our responsibility to bring a certain amount of momentum to the table, right? Like we can't expect the carpentries to, you know, give us an audience with that they will, we will then dazzle and it'll be awesome, right? Like we need to be awesome first. And, and, uh, and if we can bring an audience, I think, so something I'm, I'm hearing here that I haven't thought about a lot before is this um, learner helper instructor pipeline. It sounds like 
uh, that was key for you guys that we, we need to understand that we need to build that pipeline for ourselves. We can't, we, we shouldn't expect that the carpentries organization is, is going to hand us a pipeline that does that already. Uh, they may yeah. have it for other organizations, but they're other organ, even if they do, that may not, may or may not help us. Yeah. Or, you, I mean, just being very deliberate about, okay, what do you think it is? And then making sure that you're sharing that with the carpentry staff and that everybody's in sync yeah. and understands and, and says it's the same. I mean, it's, you don't want it to be where you think it's one pipeline and they think it's another or, <laughs> right. or they're like, oh, that's not how it really works. I mean, we, we really right. just sit down. Yep. Yeah, this is, that's excellent. Thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. This is a really excellent conversation and thank you, John, so much for sharing that experience. I do know that we have uh, three people with hands up and want to make sure that we, uh, we get to some of those questions as well. Toby? Yeah, what, one, one real finishing thing is um, you were kind of hedging and saying, you know, if we become um, learning, but, I mean, I would change that and just say when. I mean, I think right. everybody wants this to happen at some level. Okay. So it's, it's all about problem solving, you know, it's... Um, it's about putting all the problems on a piece of paper and just going through them and saying, what, what is it that we have to do to, to get past them? Um, but it's, this is, we're all in the same community. I mean, you wouldn't have like even attached yourself to the pedagogy and the branding and the community if you didn't want to be part of it and the same, you know, vice versa. So it's like, we're all in this. So it's just more of road mapping it out. So. All right. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. Um, Toby, we'll take your hand now. Okay, um, to take us, I mean, everything that John said was fantastic to hear, and thank you for sharing that. Um, I, talking about this learner helper instructor pipeline and about the idea of an instructor onboarding for HPC carpentry lessons, I, perhaps this was implied anyway in what was already discussed, but I wanna make clear that in my view, every new, technical skill and and every new skill full stop and every new concept that you're requiring instructors to pick up in that onboarding i.e that is not already taught to them in instructor training um reduces the flow through that pipeline um you know this is we i don't expect that we will ever have as many instructors in the pool to teach data carpentry astronomy, for example, as we will do to teach, um, I don't know, um, software carpentry or, or, or whatever, like, because it's a, it's a lesson that's aimed at a really specific domain. And it's also got prerequisites in terms of like Python familiarity with Python that other lessons that are aimed at novices don't have. And so the number of instructors that we have who are, who feel that they're qualified to teach those workshop is is fewer and in the same sort of way i think i i guess I, what i'd really like to hear about perhaps not today but is a is a list of what are the things that hpc carpentry instructors will need to know that won't be taught in instructor training um because you know that could be a problem um or certainly it needs to be thought about in terms of how to how to get around that um, Yeah, so I that, that so I know we've got some hands up and we'll we get I'll help let Aaron get to those. But that also comes back to the question of, I mean, I think there's a dialogue to be had there, right? So there are some things that we could make push button, right? So one of these, maybe account creation is one of these low-level logistical things, right? So um, if an instructor or workshop organizer had the ability to, you know, understood account creation in, in Linux, that simplifies things a lot, but we could also make that push button. And then, but then if it's push button, it's less flexible. Um, so is it, is the right answer a less flexible solution that enlarges the instructor pool or is the right answer a more flexible solution for fewer instructors? And I don't know the answer to that, but that's another trade-off that we need to think about. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Lex? Yes, uh, I'm very grateful for John's reflections. Um, I was on the executive council when this process happened and the one thing we found out is we need a, a roadmap. So there is a formal roadmap document in the, in the handbook, and I'll come back to that for a second. But the thing I was thinking about is that it's it, trying to put it in a slightly broader perspective before I come back to FC Carpentry, that once the merger happened and later as Library Carpentry came on board as well, 
for all three original carpentries, the question could be asked is what 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 is the what is now the community? What is software carpentry currently? What is it? What who are software carpentry? Is there still a software carpentry, or is it just now a lesson program under the carpentries? Is there still a library? Is there will there still be an HPC carpentry once it is part of the? And that's I think a very interesting question that comes back to what what kind of community do we want to be? Do we want to be uh, different branches in our communities? Do we want to be one community? Do we what's the heritage of software carpentry but that's I'll, I'll i'll leave it here but uh, and ask my question which is how far have you come by looking at the roadmap and taking a first step saying basically open a dialogue with the carpentry's uh, staff and executive council uh, i think there's an application process for becoming like a pre-incubation step or something how far are you with that and what are the roadblocks for going there yeah, so I think we're we're we 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 are. Some of us have read some of the curriculum development handbook, um, and I think one the focus that we're on at now is we feel like before we can sort of even think about formally starting the process, we need to have something like a workshop uh, or maybe a couple of workshops. So that's that's where our our sort of that's where we are on the roadmap now. Um, I think probably once we're happy with the workshop structure, we would revisit, uh, probably we would ping Toby and say, so how does this look? Should we, you know, is this, is this enough? Um, and Toby would say, as he often does, there's no formal requirement. It's a question of the very comfort level of the various people. And, and so then we would figure out where we are, you know, how comfortable we are. Um, but yeah, I think, I think we're, that's what we're doing now. I'm not hearing anything here that tells me that that's the wrong thing to do. There might be more things to do that we haven't thought of. That's okay. Um, yeah, so I think that's as far as, as near as I have an answer, that's it. Uh, Can I have a um, quick reply? Sure, yeah. I would, I would sit down with the executive council, or with the staff, executive team, and, and set up your, okay, this is what, this is what we think we need to do. What are your thoughts on it? So that we're not going into the wrong direction. Why not start that process right now on an informal level and then see where things end up? Okay, that's that's a thought. Yeah, just to just to respond to that, like um, Toby has been serving as the official core team liaison with this group, uh, and I think that I haven't been involved with those conversations yet, but um, Toby is facilitating that process, and I think that. Is working out fairly well at this point. Toby, do you have any words you wanna you wanna add? Uh, yeah, I I think it's been working pretty well up until now. But I also I really agree with Lex, and and I think um, we've talked before about the idea of of um, Andrew and Trevor and Alan and the others trying to meet with Carrie to talk talk through it and. Um, Carrie is half the executive team, Aaron's the other half, um, for, just for reference, I guess. Um, and I, I don't think it's too early to have that conversation. I think the um, HPC intro, which is roughly half of the two day curriculum is in really decent shape and has been tested way more than the requirements that, in, that are listed in that roadmap document suggest. Um, and I also think that the group has a fairly clear idea of where they want to go with the other part of the curriculum. But I also think that before, like the HPC intro stuff is like, you have to teach that if it's going to be a workshop on HPC, this, this stuff needs to be covered. What comes after that has been a, the subject of a lot of discussion. And I think that that is another reason why it might be a good time to start talking more um, with the with the leadership of the core team at least you've had some perspective of from at least past members of the of the executive council today um yeah okay i think that's all i want to say on that thank you toby and alan you've been so so patient um, thank you so much i'll take your hand i i feel like i'm taking two steps backwards with this comment however but uh, <laughs> Uh, on, it kind of goes back to this idea of the, the instructor pipeline a little bit. So one thing that I worry about a little bit is um, the tool that we choose to deliver the cluster or how we choose to provide a cluster to, to people, because that dictates what Toby was worried about, which is what are we requiring of people who are going to become instructors. And because if we are requiring them to be sysadmins of that 
system that they have access, access to, well, that's quite a large requirement, right? Um, so, and that's a big concern of mine. So, I mean, there are things out there. That's why I worry a lot about the tool that we use, right? Because there are quite clever tools out there, I would say. And the one that I've been promoting all the time is one of those, right? That, that tries to take away all that sysadmin type activity from you, where it's a lot of point and click stuff, which is at least we can document that fairly, fairly straightforwardly. And you're not going to make typos and cause huge problems, right? In the cluster. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's one thing. I would like to make sure that whatever tool we choose in the end to provide the cluster, that these are the kind of things that we worry about a little bit, that, that it doesn't bring an enormous load on the person who's delivering the lesson in the end, that it should be a minute or possible. And whether that means we have to have a support, somebody who supports these kind of things, that's maybe also something to consider. Thanks, Alan. Um, I re-raised my hand from earlier because my comment was actually going to be about, about this, this question of the specificity and flexibility of the cluster tooling. Um, so this is taking me back to the early days of the genomics curriculum for data carpentry. Um, so that lesson was originally developed, I think, to have three or four different options um, in terms of whether you run it on specific cloud systems or whether you run it on a local HPC. Um, and there, there were a couple of different options that were written into the lesson in a kind of um, a bifurcating way. Um, but that ended up being really difficult for the maintainers to kind of manage because the maintainers for the lesson then had to be familiar with each of those systems. Uh, and we ended up changing it to have the official lesson always point towards um, using uh, AWS cloud system. Uh, so all of the official centrally organized data carpentry genomics workshops run on AWS, um, even though it may in fact be the case that the organizations that were running these at have their own infrastructure and have their own clusters that would be more, I guess, appropriate to teach the learners to use because then they could continue to use those tools moving forward. Um, but at that point, it was kind of a, a, a trade-off between that, that flexibility and being um, conscious of what the learners are going to need to use moving forward. Um, and also what the maintainers can maintain, what the core team can set up workflows for. Um, and this whole question has just been revolving in my head throughout this whole conversation is how, how does that experience apply to this experience and have things changed sufficiently where we can have that kind of that kind of flexibility. Yeah, that's that's excellent. So that's as I say, as I said in the intro, this is the probably the thing that scares me the most is is this like getting this trade off between push button setup versus flexibility right. I feel like this is huge. Um, it, so it's interesting to me that you your, the I guess your experience was that the that flexibility was was a uh, the costs of maintaining the flexibility were, were very high and you eventually stopped doing it. So that's interesting. Uh, yes, I'll say this was four years ago. Um, right. The core team has developed it. The core team was much smaller back then and didn't have a lot of the technical capabilities that we have now. Um, so I think maybe we maybe we could be more flexible and have more um, robust workflows for setting up different systems at this point. But I think it's something to to seriously consider. Um, Benson, did you have uh, something to to say on this issue? Um. So. A lot of the cloud providers will support um, uh, tools that will operate on different cloud providers. So things like Terraform. Um, and that will work on AWS, on GCP, um, probably also Azure. Um, it won't give you all the kind of specialized functions on each one, but it should be flexible enough that um, at least at that level, uh, people wouldn't be constrained. And it might be helpful to have a similar setup for genomics and HPC in terms of uh, uh, kind of what's required, because if you're doing genomics in the cloud, um, many of the same things will apply for HPC. And so um, maybe even an extra module could be added to instructor training for people working in those areas. 
Thank you, Benson. Yeah, good thoughts. Your audio was a little bit crunchy, I think is the word that I would use to describe it. Um, but I think I caught I caught everything you said. Um, comments and follow up on on this issue, like people's experience with with this. Did we finally run out of questions? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was it. That was. I'll give people time to think for a little bit um, and see Toby has a has a hand here, but I just want to like emphasize this is the most action packed um, <laughs> session that I've been at so far for Carpentry Con. So uh, congratulations on introducing a, a meaty topic. OK, so I'll go with Toby, to Toby and then Alan. Um, I mean, I've got a, a list of long qu of, of big questions, I suppose. Um, uh, Alan, did you have something related to what's already been discussed that you wanted to say that you've realized that you yeah, wanted to you, say now? If you if you have a long list, I'll be quick. And um, just to mention on the funding side, I have been in discussions for other projects with AWS and Azure. Azure in particular seem to be quite keen um, to offer support for, for training resources. So they've donated to a proposal that I've done recently. And I think, I mean, I have the context now that I think these kind of things are possible and interesting for them um, because they have this hardware and they want to show it off, right? So even if we use the expensive hardware, which is GPUs and interconnects and everything, I think if you talk to the right people, there will be support um, for that kind of effort. That's all I would say. Thank you, Alan. Um, list of long questions from Toby. So okay. I mean, the first thing I'm wary of relying on the charity of cloud providers because if we were to use that as a reason to adopt the expensive fancy stuff that you just described, and then they cut us off, cut off our supply then we would have to figure out how to deal with that. Um, which is not to say that we shouldn't approach or, or look into working with credits, but um, that we need to, this focus on sustainability that John like emphasized a lot in, in what he, his experience from library carpentry was, um, you know, we have to keep that in mind in every aspect of this conversation. And then Aaron raised a hand. So back yes, to you, I just wanted to, to interrupt you quickly to talk about a, a specific experience that we've had with uh, you know relying on the generosity of, of cloud providers. Um, in the early days of the genomics lessons, we did have a pretty generous pile of credits from AWS. Um, they were very forthcoming about funding funding those workshops and providing credits for them. Um, and then they pulled back. Uh, and so that it was it was a it was a matter of how do we figure out the most efficient way now of of using these resources that we had been using kind of prolif prolifically pro profitably what's the word there um but in any case i just wanted to second what toby said about being being cautious with relying on funding and resources Okay, shall I have another go? Um, sure. <laughs> so in the that roadmap document has a lot of bullet points about a lot of things. And I think the one of the most interesting questions that I want to ask you, which I will warn you is also like one of the most job interviewee questions <laughs> there, I think. Uh, it's not like, where do you see yourself in five years? But um, it says effectively, like, how, what, one of the things that the coordinators, I guess, of the lesson project need to be able to express to the carpentries and to the carpentries executive council specifically is how they feel that becoming an official lesson program with the carpentries is going to benefit, I guess, in your case, HPC carpentry and also the carpentries and also the broader learning community. And I wonder if you've thought about that 
capturing the three different angles or if not whether I'm going to set you some homework. I think I think we have thought about it a little bit. Um, I think the I mean, I think in this, I forget if the strategic plan, um, which I might actually still have up here, um, talks about sort of, um, and speaking of job interviews, so here's a job interview answer, right? The answer is synergy. And, and the synergy is between uh, the larger and technically minded and uh, eager audience that, the, that is already aware of the carpentries as an organization because of the advocacy and branding that you guys have. And so we enrich your portfolio and you enlarge our audience. And that's kind of the, um, you know, the, the elevator pitch uh, for why this is an awesome idea. Uh, as, far as, as far as digging into like logistically, what does that mean? That's, this whole meeting is about that. So, but I think as far as like, you know, that, that, that's the skeleton of the answer. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Lex? Yeah, don't forget the money side of things. <laughs> so for the carpentries, there is there is the money side of things is really important because they're a nonprofit based on two things, funding, which is usually short term and not always uh, sustainable, and memberships and instructor training, which is the, the money maker kind of. So you need to be able to argue that adding hpc carpentry as a lesson program will lead will result in more membership organizations and instructors training requests ideally i think okay thank you Alex. i think that's i think that's true actually that having that um having hpc carpentry in the portfolio of what we're able to train folks for would probably go a long way towards improving our member portfolio is a, is a good point. Andrew, did you have something you wanted to say to that? Uh, no, I don't think so. Sorry, I thought I cut you off there. It's, okay. Well, it's just so the, the thing that I noticed is it's kind of the opposite, right? So I said, I said that you would enlarge our audience and now Lex is saying, well, we need to enlarge the Carpentries audience. So that's, I mean, possibly both of those can be true. Um, but yeah, it's a different direction than what I was thinking. But so therefore useful input. Thank you. Yeah, mutually synergistic. I think that there's definitely a number of the Carpentries does have a pretty broad audience in terms of like the number of people that we reach and the number of people who know about us. Um, and so in that sense, I think um, that's true that we could enhance the audience of HBC Carpentry, but there's also the a lot of our members, especially members who've been around with us for a long time, have kind of reached the point where they have trained people to do the things that we currently offer trainings on um, and might be very excited about having an additional set of Carpentries lessons that they could use to upskill their people. So I think it's, it's interesting to think about that next step. Toby. Yeah, I think I'd be keen to try to find some way to estimate the demand for workshops and in particular for the two different kinds of workshop, because honestly, one of my concerns is that we'll get plenty of people in the community who want to have HPC carpentry workshops, but that it's going to be skewed much more towards self-organized workshops than centrally organized workshops because I think that most people are going to want to teach their audience to use their cluster resources and they're probably going to want to use instructors that they're already familiar with to do that as well more so than than for other workshops my point being if you've got cluster resources available at your institute and you're a member organization let's say do you want to get your folks to sign up to a centrally organized carpentries workshop that teaches hpc carpentry with a cluster in the cloud that's then going to cease to exist 
or do you want them to learn those same skills on the resources that they're then going to go on and carry on using and i'm afraid my suspicion is that most of them are going to want to do the second one good thoughts toby uh benson um so i guess for the first part um where it's it's kind of learning how to submit a job. Uh, that's uh, maybe partly true. However, um, at least my experience has been that usually uh, there are a lot of, most people who use HPC are in kind of a niche area that they're working on. Um, you know, consider genomics a niche area. And usually this expertise is not always available in house, or if it is available, that person might be very busy and not able to teach introductory workshops. Um, and so finding a way to facilitate exchanging of expertise, I think would help. Um, I think there was a mention of a LAMPS workshop earlier. Um, that again is kind of a package um, that's quite specialized. And you might also find that rather than having workshops just for a particular institution, cross-institutional workshops, which bring together people who are interested in acquiring expertise in one area that um, would, be, would be very effective and would be something that would keep this sustainable. Um, many of these science communities do use open source software, um, uh, but they haven't really got a good training strategy and that's something that they could uh, probably get help with. Cool. Thank you, Benson. Alan? Um, so I have maybe a counter example a little bit. Uh, so, so I know that Exceed in the US provided training resources, right? Some kind of resources for people to give training courses on. And um, I know Europe a lot better, right? So I know exactly how Praise and stuff operate. And so Praise is kind of like the mirror organization to what? Exceed is changing its name. It's rebranding, right? To something else or becoming something else. Uh, Praise is probably going to do the same. Um, but it's like a mirror organization in Europe. And um, they have the same issue, right? So I actually had discussions with them last year about, about creating a facility where they could offer training resources to, to countries. Because the problem is the idea of running on the resource that they're actually going to use is a nice idea, but it has lots of practical issues, practical problems, right? So things like network connections and um, the, the inability to connect to the outside world, they usually have pretty strict security policies. It usually takes a num you know, days or even weeks to get accounts approved, right? So this is an awful lot of overhead. And one of, and they, they saw that, right? And they're, they're trying to avoid that, right? They were talking about buying their own hardware. I suggested that they shouldn't do that. They should just, just use the cloud. But that's exactly the kind of thing that, that umbrella organizations run into. And I think that maybe they're the right people that we should be talking to a little bit by collaborating with them. Um, to looking at organizations like Exceed and Praise, and that they could be targets as regards, you know, the membership for, for, for the carpentries. Um, but working with them uh, might be a good way forward for us, I'd say. Uh, for another reason as well. Also because they are likely the ones that would provide instructor training, right? So I already have put into a proposal I put into recently that we would have an instructor training for anyone who's giving training in that project. That's a model that I could see it being quite useful across a number of projects that I'm aware of. Um, but they probably didn't budget for something like that in the proposals that have gone in. But if you lay, if you kind of promote that idea in general, it's not relatively expensive given the size of these kinds of projects, right? But they could have a lot of knock-on benefit. And yeah, I think it's, it's an interesting thing to consider. I think the important thing is to kind of lay the egg to, to, to maybe to start with praise, have a discussion with them, do something with them to start with and um, but it's not that easy they're a big organization and they have their own problems right they have all their deliverables and everything they don't really want to talk so you kind of need to know the right people right unfortunately yeah so i guess aggregators are good people you know hpc resource aggregators or uh gateways are are good people to be talking to uh, maybe compute canada we, we, do we know the right people at compute canada i mean we have some history with them right they might be 
I know them pretty well because of this tool, Magic Castle. They're developers right. of that tool. So I, I've actually been talking to, yeah, the, the kind of higher up people in, in Compute Canada recently as well. And they actually are interested because of the interest in Magic Castle. They are interested in talking more about that in the next month, actually. Okay. If, if this was a tool that might be used, they would be interested in supporting that. But that's those discussions are very, very early days, right? I think we're winding down. We've got about five minutes left in the session. Um, if folks have other thoughts, questions, concerns they'd like to raise. This has certainly been a very um, rich discussion. I hope that we have some good notes in. I actually have the... something to mention. I don't know if I can go on. Sure. Yes, please. Okay. Yeah, so I noticed that for the developer part of the content that Andrew was talking about, well, okay, anyway. Uh, so it looks like snake make is the, I don't know, snake make or containerization, if I got that right. So snake make is the workflow tool of choice at the moment for okay. the user track, not okay. for the developer track. Okay, and then developer, I don't think we have made tool selection for the developer track. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. So, so I work in genomics for the most part, and I, of course, SnakeMake is one of the you know frameworks we use as well, like Cromwell, SnakeMake, Nextflow. But personally, and I believe a lot of people that do bioinformatics actually do Nextflow, uh, and I was going to just find out if there is a reason why it's not part of the considerations or if, I mean, I haven't been actively involved in the conversation, so I might actually be asking the wrong question. That's one. And the second thing is, I suggest that containerization, whether it's in Glide or Docker, also be somewhere there as a consideration at least. So that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Yeah, so um, I would invite you to the sprint later today, if you, that's at all feasible for you. Um, we're sprinting on the this the whole through this whole conference. We're sprinting on the on the uh, Snake Make uh, based HPC workflows lesson. Um, I don't have a link, Andy, but it's in the Carpentries calendar. But yeah, so the the question of whether Snake Make is the right tool has come up, and the the pro is um, Snake Make is there's there's existing material which is you know lowers the effort to to making it happen. Uh, and it and there, and it's used in a number of other lessons in the carpentries, and so it's kind of there's the more of that you know overlap with th other things that are already in the carpentries, which might help lower the barrier for instructor training. But uh, you know, as we're working through it, uh, the the question certainly has come up, and and people are have expressed some doubts, and there are other there definitely are alternatives. Um, so I yeah, I want to advocate for next flow. Okay. <laughs> I am actually, so yesterday I started to tier Nextflow modules. I'm working on the customized content now. So, so I'm going to I tier can... Nextflow. Okay. So no. we can we can and have had discussions about which workflow tool is best workflow tool. The idea here is that, so somebody else has already developed content from, so they derived a lesson from HPC Carpentry and tailored it to SnakeMake and we see a fairly direct path forward to converting that lesson back into an HPC Carpentry lesson that fits well and builds on previous materials and SnakeMake builds on Python and existing HPC stuff and we can see a pathway forward relatively easily. And we would be introducing a workflow management tool and then toward the end of the lesson, we can express or explain or clarify to students that you have a lot of options in the workflow manager uh, space and you should use what you've learned about this workflow tool and go out and find one that fits your application best. So we're not gonna, we're not planning to litigate which tool we're gonna teach in the workflow <laughs> lesson. Certainly not here. <laughs> and certainly not in the next two minutes. Um, right. So it is, it is the very end of the session. Um, I wanted to turn it back to the, the session leads in case you have any final, final words you'd like to share with the group. So I just want to thank everybody for their participation. This has been this has been more successful than I was expecting. I was I was anticipating a lot of dead air and me reiterating questions, but this has been great. I think we've got a lot of good feedback. There's issues that 
that are whose salience I have maybe not appreciated and some issues I hadn't thought of at all. Uh, so thank you so much, everyone, for the input. And I guess I have an administrative question for Aaron. Is it possible? I, I know we did this in the um, sprint to capture the chat. Is that something you can do I or I can do? I do not know. Um, I think I think Andrew can do it. I, as far as I can tell, everybody on the call has the ability okay. to save the chat. Um, okay. So I, how how do we do that? Um, so the the little more button um next to where you type the message so it's three ah. dots on my in my there's a save chat option ah, the only thing I'll, I'll warn you about is that um probably when you save your chat it will include your private messages to other people on the call so before you post that chat to slack just make sure that you've removed anything <laughs> that you don't want to be there but please don't remove any of the messages that were to everyone because i think at that point it counts as doctoring the record for um, <laughs> removing the private messages is fine thank you toby for that note all right um with that i will say this is a wonderful session thank you so much for for organizing